Welcome everyone to our final panel in the Be Bold series. Before we get started, we want to give you a little taste of what the Be Bold series was like. So let's throw it into a video. When I was hired by the Cardinals, and of course the narrative is, oh, it's publicity stunt. I'd like to really kind of dig into that and see what a publicity stunt is, because if you took my gender off of my resume, would anybody have doubted the hire of a four-time Super Bowl champion with two gold medals on Team USA, an eight-time Pro Bowler, and oh, by the way, a master's in sports psychology and a PhD. I mentor young journalists of color all the time, create those spaces and young women who are budding sports journalists, I can't tell you how many come up to me and say they wanna be in this field, but there's no place for them. No, 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 someone made you think. Yeah, that's true. Someone made you think that. There is always enough space. If there's enough hockey writers in one outlet to cover every single NFL team or ho hockey team, but not one full-time beat writer to cover the WNBA, I'm sorry, there's a problem with that. When we think about diversity, there's a lot of major buckets that a lot of people think of. So like international women's stages happened and they look at women as a whole. And there's so many different types of women, whether it's from where you come from because of your ethnic background, whether it's the socioeconomic class you're in, whether it's just the country that you were born in. And there's so many different things that influence what your contributions can be and how you kind of connect with people. And I think in my current role at the COC, it's really good to kind of understand all of those different elements because I do focus so much on athlete storytelling and telling their stories. So understanding the full picture, you kind of can't look at them as just one lens. It's the intersectionality of it all. What a great video and this event is being co-hosted by GXS Lab and Shoes for Sport. We have come such a long way since our first event and things are so different right now, especially with everything being virtual. So GXS Lab is a connection between scholarly research and industry practice in sport and sport media. GXS focuses on the intersection and knowledge transfer between globalization, digitalization and commercialization. Anka Jess is the CEO and founder of She's for Sport. She is passionate about communications and empowering women and girls. In 2016, she combined her love of sport and over 10 years of communication and media relations experience to launch She's for Sports. The organization gives women and diverse groups a larger voice in sports through digital content and events. The network represents a community of over 5,000 passionate women and men who want to amplify and celebrate the contributions of women in sports. She has produced nine events and two digital series. She leads by sport and we are sport, conversation with the BIPOC sports community. Anka has also provided strategic communications and media relations support to various organizations, including Manulife, the City of Ottawa, PwC and BMO. She's a 2020 Canada's Most Powerful Women Top 100 Award nominee. So big round of applause for Miss Anka Jen. <laughs> Thank you for that warm welcome, Isabel. Uh, you know, I love that video because it reminded me of just connecting with women uh, and, and diverse people in sport on site and uh, being able to hear from different women across the sports landscape and, and come together to celebrate these, uh, these, these great people who are contributing to sport. I actually had someone say to me, they missed our cupcakes uh, that we actually have at our events. Somebody emailed me that the other day. So I know we're all missing um, you know, on-site events and hopefully we'll get to that one day soon, but it's great to convene this way virtually. Um, you know, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you guys today, uh, something interesting happened. I was on Twitter and I was uh, looking at a question that an organization was asking about, why did you become an entrepreneur? But you had to do it in five words or less. So uh, I took a go at it and I wrote, to drive inclusion in sport. And that really has been our mission for She's for Sports. Um, you know, as uh, Isabel mentioned, we've been uh, here for almost about five years. 
and we've held nine events and uh, we did two digital series. And, you know, even though COVID came, we just still tried to keep on going to tell all of these great stories and share the voices of women in sport. Uh, it's, there's a lot of work, you know, we, we see what has happened this year with uh, social injustice and we see um, different sport leagues speaking up against anti-Black racism. There's a lot of work to do when it comes to inclusion in sport, but I know that we'll get there. And we'll get there because we have great, a great community of people who are driving change in sport including our inspiring panel. So if you want to know a little bit more about Shoes for Sports, check us out on social media. Um, I know we have a limited amount of time, um, so you can learn a little bit more about Shoes for Sports on our website, but I really want to get into these wonderful women that we have on our panel today. So first up is Tiffany Kelly. Tiffany Kelly is a sports entrepreneur, data scientist, public speaker, and philanthropist. She's currently the founder and CEO of Cura Story. The easiest way to get started creating videos while first focusing on a unique market, professional athletes, and student athletes. Before making her leap in the world of startups, she was the first African-American analyst to join the ESPN Stats and Information Group as Sports Analytics Associate, where she created ESPN's College Football Fan Happiness Index. She also inspires youth and women in STEM to use their gifts to change sports and sports tech for a better future as a mentor for various organizations. Auburn Sigurdsson. Auburn is an Olympian and retired Team Canada softball athlete. She's the executive director of the first international ESPNW program uh, that will take place in Vancouver. And she's a director of brand and strategy for Torque Strategies, a strategic sponsorship and marketing agency. Auburn has over 16 years of experience in marketing and communications. Prior to this role as an associate partner with the 2010 group, Auburn led client accounts, including Whistler Blackcomb, Chorus Entertainment, Man and managed the firm's marketing and communications. Prior to that, Auburn served as the manager of communications and community engagement at the Canadian Sport Institute. She also gives back to the game she loves as a master pitching instructor for Softball Canada's Can Pitch program. Farrah Bastian. Farrah Bastian is the manager of data engineer and data science at MLSE Digital Labs. In 2016, Farrah completed her master's in analytics at Queen's University with a focus on multivariate st statistics and optimization, which I'm sure she'll tell us all about when we start talking to her. Her current research focuses on sport-centric data science with a big lens on inter Inter interpretability and scaling. Her team works on long-term research projects assisting with scouting, drafting, sports, health science, and game strategy across MLSC's properties, including the Toronto Raptors. And uh, we also have Laurel Walzak. Um, you know, Laurel has been very special with, uh, you know, working with Shoes for Sports and um, collaborating through our partnerships. And it's been a great uh, opportunity to work with Laurel, uh, the GXS Lab staff in Ryerson. Laura Walzak is an assistant professor of the RTA School of Media Sport Media Program in FCAD, the Faculty of Communication Design at Ryerson University. In 2018, she founded the Global Experiential Sport Lab, GXS Lab, a research lab that exists within FCAD's Catalyst Research Hub in Toronto, and which serves as the connection between scholarly research and industry practice in sport and sport media. Laurel's a senior strategic and innovative professional with 20 years of experience serving the sports health and fitness and consumer goods industries with roles at FitNef Inc, the National Hockey League, Molson Coors Canada, and the National Football League. She recently co-edited a book called Sport Media Vectors, Digitization, Expanding Audiences and the Globalization of Live Sport, published by Common Ground Research Networks. And Laurel rounds out our panel. Thank you ladies for joining me uh, this evening. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my um, talk before I read the bios, you know, this year has been a hard year for all of us and it has been a year um, that no one expected was going to be like this and nothing we've, we've all been through before. So I want to ask each of you, how are you doing and can you touch a little bit on how your industry or your job has shifted uh, in this new climate and Tiffany, I'll start with you. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome bio. Um, actually, it COVID has kind of sped up um, our product and our launch. So we allow creators to create videos for free, um, music, editing, quality equipment, literally everything, um, and then also find sponsors. And so they record their own ads instead of um, accepting a random platform ad like YouTube which um, majority of them don't get paid from that anyway. So that's what we're doing. And we were gonna launch, I think, January, February of 2021, but um, 
just with the amount of athletes kind of shooting their own content now, like at the bubble and the wobble, a lot of media personnel couldn't go into it um, because they were limiting contact. And so, so many athletes were just starting to just shoot their own video series um, and just really dip their toe in the water for user generated content, which is awesome. Wanted that to happen. Um, So yeah, it's really sped up our process for launching. We went live this week. So that's been pretty crazy. Um, Personally, I'm fine. I'm home in Louisiana right Mm now. Um, back at home with my family. So I had to get out of New York. It was, it was pretty crazy, but yeah, I would say just exponentially video is kind of skyrocketing, which is awesome. And Auburn, I'll get you, I'll ask Kate, you to ask, answer the same question. Well, I have two toddlers at home, so COVID's been interesting <laughs> in truth. Um, but what I'll say is, I mean, so much of the work I'm doing right now is in the realm of women's sport and Um, the way that people are consuming sport right now is shifting and it's really exciting. And I'm really excited to see the innovation and the creativity that has had to come out of this, this time. Um, I mean, Tiffany, what you're doing is an exact example of that, but, um, but also this, the spotlight's shifting and people are demanding a little bit more change, um, in terms of consumption of sport and women's sport in particular, uh, WNBA numbers are, were way up and WSL numbers are way up. You know, we're seeing people voting with their dollars and also wanting to um, support women's sport as a bit of a political statement or a a social statement, uh, socio-political statement, I should say. Um, And it's all really positive. So the momentum that's shifting here is is energizing and has shifted our business in a big way. And Farah? Yeah, it's been fantastic for me for the part initial part of it I mean COVID has been horrible for sports overall but I think um, I finished uh, my maternity leave in April and then jumped right into uh, work which was great because I got to spend a bit more time seeing my daughter um, who was nine months at the time and uh, but at the same time I think um, it allowed me to focus uh, with myself with my team very differently um, understanding kind of, I think I, Anka, I've talked to you about this before, kind of really focusing on what our intention is as a data science team, what, what do we want to accomplish, uh, not only for like within sports, but uh, with everything happening around the world, um, how can we contribute uh, in a more meaningful way? Uh, so I think that that's been one of the more pivotal uh pivotal things for a thing for the, for the team. But the other thing would be, I think, seeing our organization at MLSC, uh, making sure that it's not only the company that is driving discussions around um, diversity and inclusion, but employees and managers are also kind of participating. Um, and and that's that has been refreshing, even, you know, post-election, um, so, so yeah, it's uh, honestly, uh, for us, it's, it's been great. And Laurel. Uh, yeah, so we, oh, this, I would say it's, we've had some really great times and we've had some challenging times for sure at the university. Uh, I was, you know, just chatting today with someone about the fact that this, the university students are not on campus. And that's a big part of not only studying, of course, but being able to be with your peers and socialize and go out and you know, classes is, and and education is only part of their overall university experience. That said, with the lab overall, uh, we've had a tremendous uptick in uh, interest in the lab. Last year, I employed seven people. This year, we have 100 uh, students and or employees in the lab, which is outrageous. Uh, You know, half of it is because of the fact that unfortunately there are no there are no jobs for the students right now because there is no sport and that's obviously impacted us negatively however we're looking at this positively because how are we able to create more research projects how are we able to be a little bit more innovative in how we're looking at broadcast and media and sport and you know remote productions the, the interacting with one another and having more time The one thing that I found during this process, especially being in academia and a scholar in sport media, is the time to really think about what's going on in sport and where is it going. And that's a a little bit of 
really the lab is this predictive futuristic nature. And so having more time that we're not running around going to a million different events and uh, having so many things to do has really allowed us to take a step back and think about the future and see how we can contribute to what that solution is going to look like. Yeah, let's talk about where sports is going. On the digital growth side, uh, Farah, this year's sport landscape was very unique. Uh, there was a reliance on sport brands to leverage more digital engagement. We saw the digital screens um, in the in the bubble, in the bubble. Um, MLB stadiums look different. No fans, uh, you know, in the stands, but the cardboard cutouts of people's faces. Um, what more can we expect to see in fan in, on the fan engagement side? Um, you know, on the digital, the digital, but with the digital growth. I know that when we did our pre-call, you talked about working with the Raptors and uh, Toronto FC and, and different leagues um, to see sort of how data and and digital can influence, um, you know, some of that fan and that new fan engagement. Yeah, great question. Uh, so from a fan engagement perspective, what one thing that is big for us was identifying that fans see community in sports. Uh, so when you're watching from home, uh, that community feel often can lack. Um, so I think one thing that has been that has been something that's the top of the list is creating this virtual community when fans are watching uh, sports programming, whether it's Toronto FC, whether it's the Raptors, whether it's the Maple Leafs. Um, so I think part of that is just having conversations, you know, integrating uh, quizzes to kind of test to see how how much of a loyal fan you really are. Um, and yeah, just just to just to kind of keep the conversation, keep the fans engaged, because the other thing to note is a society is in general had tend to have a very short attention span. So mm -hmm. no longer do they, you know, continuously watch a particular programming when you look at broadcast broadcasting data. So what are those things that you need to focus on at what, you know, points do fans kind of drop off watching a particular video, whether online or whether in broadcast that you can kind of, you know, trigger them to kind of, or create motivations or understand their behavior into like how you can kind of continue getting them to be attentive through a game. And it, you know, if that's even valuable to the fan themselves, right? Uh, maybe the consumption of media should be completely different in snippets. So. Yeah, this, this has been, I think, great. I know MLSC has been working on products around, uh, around this. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think for NBA uh, series starting in December, we should have uh, our kind of like our digital arena ready to go for, uh, for at least our members. And Tiffany, you know, Care Story gives student athletes a power to share their voice and platform on their own terms. How important uh, is it to have af the athletes, you know, have control of their own voice and drive social injustice through the conversations that they would like to have? Yeah, I, it's extremely important. I, when I was at ESPN, just kind of being in the belly of the beast, uh, top media publisher for sports, it was interesting just kind of noticing how athletes just weren't working with us anymore because they kind of wanted to control and put um, their own stories out there and talk about what they wanted to talk about. That's kind of why you see Uninterrupted and just all of these different um, media companies run by athletes, religion of sports that are just all popping up, right? And so just noticing that happening at EFPN um, and just what the creator economy is actually doing to traditional media, it's it's never going to be the same. Like I think Golik and Wingo, like they just ended his contract and not going to be renewed. Like creators that have been right with these companies for for years. So um, just this huge change and this shift was happening. And obviously with NCAA coming out and saying that student athletes can monetize starting in August of next year, I think it's huge. And I think that. Um, so many athletes are just kind of want, want to talk about social justice or whatever is just on their minds and um, fans are just so interested. Um, obviously, I feel like I don't need to say, but fans most likely follow the athlete as opposed to the team and the brand. Um, and of course, it's kind of this symbiotic relationship that happens, but um, I mean, fans are listening to what they have to say and just what their lives are like. And the shift of what is authentic to Gen Z is completely changing. Um, my roommate finds content on YouTube more authentic than like the news or which is which is crazy when you think about it that way. 
Um, but I, I think it's huge and I think it's amazing. And um, I'm just super excited to kind of see what happens and allowing just athletes to actually own their voice and obviously get paid for it, but um, put out the stories that they, that they, that they feel is important. Laurel, you bring an academic lens to the sport industry. Can you tell us what trends you're seeing uh, through the research and through some of the things that you are, you're reading or, you know, your colleagues in the industry, what are they saying about the sport landscape? Um, and how are you preparing your students to be successful in this evolving sport uh, environment? Mm -hmm. Well, the first I would say it, overall for everyone is resilience. And so we've said to our students from day one and right into April is what are you going to do with this time? We don't know how long we're going to be in COVID. And so we can, uh, to everyone, first of all, take some time to mourn what we just lost, which was our time, our freedom, our health, you know, so many things that were associated with that in the first, you know, 30 to 60 days of COVID. But after that, once you've had a chance to mourn and go through those feelings, what are you going to do with that time? And this is where, we encourage our students to be the future leaders and think about how we are uh, looking at innovation. And I've said that before, and this is where to understand the role that esports and streaming has, um, to understand remote production and what can we be doing outside of being in the field of play from a broadcast production standpoint, and also as marketers, how can we use digitally differently? Because you know, this is the, the where we're looking at this from a future perspective is this is going to be a hybrid moving forward. We're not going to go back to the way that we were. Mm. And the traditional landscape is, is definitely changing. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased with the students in terms of them being resilient, but also all of our instructors and professors that are really taking the bull by the horns to say, listen, we've got to look at this differently, research it and understand. The role of analytics and the role of technology is a big part of all of this, especially since we look at the globalization of, of sport and, and specifically live sport. So that's that's one area. The other is, uh, and Ayanka, you and I had this conversation. I, I'm, I'm pretty provocative and bold when I say this. I think that there's a lot of sport structures and systems that are in place that require dismantling. And this is where we get the unfortunate but fortunate opportunity to dismantle them. And, and specifically how the NSOs and the PSOs exist for multiple sports in our country and many countries around the world. And so how can we take a look at how that power structure can change, um, you know, uh, looking at equity, diversity, inclusion and the social injustice, justices that do exist and let's, you know, there's a lot of intersectionalities, but specifically here today with women. And so the structure does not support the way we want to support women in, in sport, whether that's women playing sport, women, women at the highest levels of playing, working in sport and sport media. So this is that opportunity. And I do see there's a great opportunity to dismantle and deconstruct uh, the way that sport exists. And so you know, that, that takes a, a lot of effort. You know, a lot of sport organizations, of course, are not getting the same funding as they were in the past. However, we, you know, I spoke the other day to David Shaw, who's the uh, executive vice president over at UFC, and they're one organization that has, has generated tremendous amount of revenue through their streaming and pay-per-view pay channels uh, solely by uh, being successful in their fight island and making sure that they continue to do sport and they're doing that by being innovative. And the one thing that I said to the students that I just recently was really what Dana White said and which is nothing is impossible and I think that mm. is the, what we can take forward uh, with the students and all of us in this industry nothing is impossible. Auburn, I want to get you in on this too. Um, you know, uh, Laurel talked about dismantling and we're also seeing transformation and we're seeing brands and sponsors trying to figure it out in this new world. Um, let's, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, how some sport brands are addressing anti-Black racism and inclusion and why is it important for them to make sure their values align with the values of their consumers? Mm. Oh yeah, I mean, purpose and values is like at the forefront of what everybody's talking about right now. And we're we're in a dangerous place where, you know, people see through it if it's not authentic, right? Um, but if you're not uh, walking the walk and, and doing um, what your consumer expects of you, you know, cancel culture is a real thing. 
Um, but frankly, there's a whole generation of people, millennial and Gen Z, that are, or Gen Z, whatever you want to say, are, um, are voting with their dollar hands down. And it's, it's all about um, purpose and being aligned with values. So when it comes to a brand that you know, tells a great story, maybe they put out a beautiful advertisement that tells a story about their efforts in this space, but they're not actually changing their operational models, um, investing in communities that, uh, and initiatives that support this, um, you're gonna see a big shift in the way consumers behave. So yeah, when it comes to sponsorship, that is true hands down, it has been true for a long time, um, but it's becoming more and more apparent and more uh, acute. Uh, to, in today's day and age. And I want to stick with you because I know we have a lot of student athletes um, tuning in or listening or we'll look at the recording after. You um, are a, you were a, a, a pro softball um, athlete, you went to the Olympics, and then you transitioned into working in the corporate world in marketing. Can you talk a little bit about that transition? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, it's an interesting experience. It's a long time ago, so I have to hearken back a little bit, but <laughs> um, it's a funny thing. And I think that a university athlete can relate to this just as well as anybody who's invested a lot of time in anything and has mm -hmm. to make a change. Uh, you go through a bit of an identity crisis. You go through a lot of um, emotions and challenges and, and anybody actually who retires from any career, whether you're 65 doing that or 25 like I was, um, you have you have to find your way. Um, so, I mean, softball is such a niche sport. I never was going to make any money in it. And so at the age of 25, I realized, okay, it's time to go and catch up with my, my peers and, and start investing in a career. I was really lucky that I went to school and studied something that su suited my skill set and allowed me to, to align to my passions and, and pursue um, a career here. Um, it's, it's a, I don't know, what, what else do you want to know? I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. It certainly fueled the path I'm on today. Like what I can say is that the projects that I'm working on today are like the convergence of everything that I have lived to date. I was one of those female athletes playing in front of empty stadiums. And I've been an athlete playing in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And, um, and it really sparked um, a question that, that sent me on this a journey of curiosity into the, the realm of women's sport is why doesn't interest align? Why aren't people showing up for something that's, you know, quite a compelling product and not necessarily just about softball, obviously, any, any women's sport. So um, I feel like it's, it's sent me on a bit of a, a life journey for sure. That is such a good question. I just want to say, yeah. Like, yeah, go ahead. I feel like it, it is heavily because of the media as well. Um, and I, and that's also the beauty of just what we're building with Kira's story too. We had a, we were on call with the WMBPA um, and just going through all negotiations with the players associations. And it's funny because um, the executive director, Terry Jackson was just like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna shoot it straight to you and just ask you a question. Like, I'm tired of being lumped in like as just an extra add on for sponsors. Like I'm just tired of female athletes WNBA players just being like, yeah, and we'll just sprinkle in some WNBA players with some NBA players that are getting these huge, huge sponsorship deals. Um, and she was basically just asking like why Kira story is not going to be, or not going to do the same thing. And it's, it's so true because now, because media has changed completely, like female athletes have the power in their hands um, to change that. Like, users and fans are following the athletes and I think it's an amazing thing that's happening because like being able to control your own content and your own media and letting fans into the into your life like what it actually is to be an athlete both on the field and off the field on the court off the court um and then just turning that into dollars and then that just then ESPN being like oh okay we should probably put them on the air because they have all of these followers, right? So I think the pendulum is actually swinging, um, and it's such it's it's such a frustrating thing that it took this long for it to kind of happen. Um, but yeah, that question is something that I'm thinking about heavily as well too. I just wanted to make that note. I no, I, awesome. I like that jumping in. Um, I just far, go ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. This is, so, so from a research standpoint, this is yes. Give us the data. Data. Yeah. Data. The, <laughs> A few things. Well, first of all, 
Not only do I have <laughs> data, but I have the hands-on experience because I was chair of, the, chair of the board of the Canadian Women's Hockey League. We had to make the most difficult decision of my entire life as a woman who advocates for women in sport, which was we are, we, we cannot go on. We're not financially stable. And and to see that that there's so many different ways, sponsors not paying the right amount of money, broadcasters not paying the right amount of money, um, you know, the the it's almost the, the the two organizations divided when we should be joining together, and and all of the complexities that go with that. And media has a huge uh, uh, stake in this because you're right, and this is where owning your content and really making sure that we get to air, and it shouldn't be on air on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. when no one is watching sports. It should be prime time on Saturday <laughs> night or Monday true. night or Wednesday night, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But in, in addition to that as well, it is really being able to, at the end of the day, create the business case for uh, how we can monetize women's sports. But also, the it's such this catch-22. If we don't put women's sports on air, we can't monetize it. So give us the opportunity to be on air give us frequency, you know, the CWHL, it was four times a year on prime, prime broadcasts. That's not enough to be able to build the fan base. So, you know, there is tremendous opportunity. And I love the fact that now that we have all of these other platforms, digital platforms, uh, streaming platforms that, that we are able to get more fan base, but it's not enough. And to the research side, I looked to Cheryl Cookie and Michael Messner, who had been studying broadcast media and women's sports for more than 20 years. And they did a longitudinal study for 20 years. And they looked at what the media was doing in terms of reporting, silent reporting, airing games. And they looked at it 20 years later and the needle was hardly moved. And mm. it's really, as much as we're seeing more things because of media and the access to media, it seems like we're moving the needle, but I just criticize so highly the broadcasters because we are not moving it fast enough. And the fans, and by the way, I, I, I do, I, I'm obviously an advocate for the players, but the players really do need to, uh, all of the female players um, have to have a different type of conversation because I do think, unfortunately, based on the research that there's gonna have to be some sacrifice at play to be able to get where we need to get to. Um, in the meantime, and, and, and what we're doing at a research level and what we're doing at, at board levels as women, and even as I was saying, we need to deconstruct the NSOs and the PSOs in this country. Otherwise, like I don't even think, how can we increase the participation for all the females? My, my final point on that is, is that all of us need to come together and really try to remove those barriers so that the women don't have to sacrifice. And that's something that I feel like we're constantly doing all the time to it, like we spend all of our time trying to remove a barrier versus like why don't we just put the barrier aside and put them on air and see what happens anyway that's, no, that's my take <laughs> that's great points you know and we look at um you know the growth of women's sport we look at the fact that you know women should be getting the same sponsorships as men and the content that we're seeing we want it to be inclusive but i think moving the needle also um should include who's behind the scenes in terms of women uh, working in sport and that pipeline growing. And Farah, we touched on a little bit of that in our call. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your, your thoughts on that? Um, you had some statistics about you know, the, the women that work in STEM in sport um, and women of color who work in STEM in sport. And we know that's a very low number. Um, so do you have any thoughts on that? And then Tiffany, I see that you wanna get into that, that too. She, she leaned closer to the screen. So I'll get you to comment about that but I'll get Farah's um, comments first. Yeah, um, I think when you look at the world of STEM, uh, diversity is a bigger issue than people would like to you know, really talk about. And then when you layer sport on top of it, it's even more drastic, right? Um, I think one of the numbers I shared with you was that 4% uh, of data scientists uh, in field identify as black. Um, and you have about in Canada, 2% of uh, just people in STEM who identify as indigenous women. Um, when Canadian population is 6% uh, is identifies as indigenous. So to me, um, I mean, it is, uh, it, is, it is scary because it's, uh, you know, it's interesting that I'm asking myself these questions and focusing on these numbers today 
uh, but we need to do something to uh, to basically move the needle. Um, some of the challenges, even in the space of tech, that a lot of uh, you know uh, black founders face is they don't get enough funding for a lot of their projects. Um, and then when you layer again sports on top of it, it is very different. And I think the other thing is and maybe I'm kind of going all over the place, but I'll summarize. It's okay. I, th I think it's one thing that people sometimes forget when they talk about inclusion and diversity is why is that important? It's important because children as young as in kids in kindergarten, and this is from a research uh, done as or, you know late as 2019 in Switzerland, uh, children identify the topic, the subject of math and science to masculinity. And that's kind of messed up to me. Uh, that why, why does gender even have anything to do with it? Um, and then there's a whole bunch of research that associate where, you know, there are certain individual sports that female identifies more with than, you know, uh, team sports. Um, and that also trickles down into how fans consume media, whether female fans or male fans. Um, so, so it's, a uh, it's it's very interesting to kind of look at the numbers and uh it's it's not that there is not an interest or there isn't enough females in sport or there isn't enough female who are interested in sport um i think it is that thing in their head that maybe they don't feel like they belong and on top of that there are barriers there there are systematic barriers that exist for them um and yeah, it's it, it's a tough subject to cover, but I think really acknowledging that a problem exists and mm. you know putting putting the facts behind it, whether you're talking to a white colleague or a you know black colleague, uh, those conversations are very important to have. Um, I think you and I mentioned this, just having having fact based conversations versus having conversations that that you know the other the recipient might not fully understand i often find that with uh, with sports too right um it's the intention for everyone might not be there to them it might be a checklist a linkedin share uh but i think uh it's important i think talking about numbers and facts will give people the understanding why it's important because one day they could be a girl dad i like that tiffany did you want to talk about that a little bit touching on just the, yeah. you know, um, Farah said there's barriers, but just talking about why we need representation of women from all backgrounds, intersectionality, working in sport um, at this time as well, too. I definitely agree with, before Farah started talking, you mentioned um, just behind the scenes in the pipeline, extremely important because obviously is being CEO and just having some of these conversations with these directors and, and whatnot of these unions and they hold the purse strings and majority of the time the people that hold the purse strings do not look like me do not look like you ladies and it's 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 very frustrating um just trying to like knock them over the head with why it's so important it's so important and as far as talking I was just thinking about just like growing up so my mom got her degree in computer science like coded at MIT a complete whiz right so like I grew up thinking that it was normalized um and just a woman coding was completely normal um and I I intentionally made the decision to go into data science and because I did not want to be discriminated against in sport I've said it many many times like in articles and things that I've done um working with an NBA team and just seeing how um, the stats guys were just kind of lifted up as these amazing humans and um, being able to work with numbers was going to kind of edge in my favor because if I had the same numbers as a white guy, like I couldn't be discriminated against. That's literally how I looked at it at 17 years old. And I think part of that was also having two amazing parents that told me to not be naive, but also to not let my color and my gender stop me from anything. Um, fast track to me being the first African-American on my team, fast track to me being the only black woman in a 400 person department um, at the largest sports media conglomerate. Um, 
it was it was really interesting because so much about DNI we talk about like okay acquisition acquisition but majority of it needs to be focused on retention like I completely changed my entire life to live in Connecticut and it was probably the most lonely just being the only one um the most lonely thing and just kind of having like jabs and jokes here and there about just being an equal opportunity hire or like me getting a corner office in two days. Um, just things that are just so frustrating when, I mean, you're trying to work with your peers and your colleagues. Um, and I don't know, like, I don't want to just keep talking about how crappy it is. I, I want to change. I want it to change so badly. Um, and I don't know, it's hard. Like a lot of the times, I don't know how we're going to. Um, and I know I started my own startup and I'm super bullish on diversity. I think 80% of our founding team are women or people of color um, and just wanting them to feel comfortable um, just in a <laughs> dynamic of a company. So um yeah, that's a lot of thoughts that I just that I just said. <laughs> but they were authentic um, thoughts, and it's probably what everybody else is thinking. You know, um, I this whole year I've had conversations with different people who are finding out about Chiefs for Sports, or they want to know, you know, why I'm doing this. And um, I, I can say the majority of the times when men call me, they'll say, oh, you know, getting women in sport and growing the game, it's going to be such a lot. It's going to be a lot of work. It's a big burden. And I don't look at it that way. Yes, it's a lot of work, but we, ha we can't stay stuck where we are. We have to move forward, um, whether it's startups, grassroots or large conglomerates working with startups, um, people coming up with very innovative ideas to invest in women's sport. We have to move forward. So anybody that calls me and says, Oh, you know, like you're thinking too high or you're thinking like, you know, it's, it's, you're going to have to wait for some more centuries and, you know, just be patient. We have to move forward. And it's very, um, I think sometimes when people call me and they've been in the business for a very long time, it's very disappointing for me. Cause I'm like, I've just been doing this for four years. Like let's move forward. Let's try to make small gains as we can or big ones, but we, we can't stay stuck. And, you know, I see Laurel nodding her head, you know, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> And then I'll get Auburn to answer after. I am just shocked when I hear somebody say something like advocating for women in sport is a burden. I heard yeah. something the other day, we're doing some research. It has nothing to do with this, this, this research, but we happen to be doing some diversity inclusion research in many sport organizations right now about how they can uh, create change and mobilize change. And I was just, I was chatting with a woman at an organization. I couldn't believe what I heard. It was similar to what you just said about the fact that we're a burden. And so she was gonna be on an anti-racism, anti-black racism committee, an anti-racism committee, uh, gender equity, diversity committee, whatever they sort of, there was this, this big long name of a committee yeah. for their organization. They tend to be lumping everything together. <laughs> and boss said to her, how like is this going to take away from your day-to-day -day job and i went she she called to talk to me about it and i said oh what like it actually takes time out of your day to not be racist to not be sexist it <laughs> actually takes time out of your day like you see that as taking time out of your day and i am appalled and that's where you know i you know i'm outspoken about this and i can't help but hold back on that and when i hear that i ain't got, You've done such amazing things. I love working with you. <laughs> wow, I'm sorry to hear something. Yeah, no, I, I get phone calls from people who have, you know, larger um, either sports startups or they've been in the industry for a while and they're like, oh, I've heard somebody even make a comment before. Oh, it's good that you got into this diversity thing four years ago because it's trending now. And I'm like, I'm not doing this for a because it's a trend. Like, this is hard work. After the Zoom, I'm gonna go and lie down. <laughs> Um, you know, so, but it, it, for me, what keeps me going is seeing women like you all and meeting other diverse people who are saying enough is enough. We have to build this pipeline. Enough is enough. We've got to feature this woman on our magazine who's doing great things in sport because we can't go backwards. So Auburn, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what are you, what are you seeing um, with um, conversations around the growth of women's sport and um, companies who really
really want to walk the walk and talk the talk and say we've got to start and we've got to move forward. I know uh, ESPNW just finished their uh, their their annual conference um, in the states, and and I know we were both tuning in and we've got insights from that. So, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I mean, I live in Canada, and what I can say is that the corporate culture and the culture of sponsors in Canada is a little bit um, conservative and worry or not nervous to dive in head first. Um, we're seeing really great work being done south of the border in Australia, in the UK in particular. Um, brands are starting to step up and recognizing that, you know, standing for something means something. I'd love to see the day when investing in women's sport isn't a cause based platform or you know based on inspiration porn as they call it like it's not about that it's about the you know the the effort on the field and whatnot and i think that that is coming and um, but we're still at that stage in the evolution of what women's sport represents to a brand um but what it represents to a consumer is shifting significantly right we're seeing um, viewership going up hand over fist since 2015 you know we saw stadium sold out here in Canada for the Women's World Cup 2016 we saw the Canadian women's um, national team bring home almost all medals came from women right and it's just it's growing consumers are tuning in they want more and I think as that you know model shifts um, brands will become more bold more courageous and more you know brazen to make those investments at the the summit that happened online a couple of weeks back we heard from Budweiser who's doing amazing work in this space and AT&T and others and I think they're they're incredible case studies that the other brands need to take notice of um, but broadcasters as well like Laurel described like it's an ecosystem and without all the pieces of the puzzle how can we move it forward? Um, we're also seeing some really, I just wanna make a, a mention to Athletes Unlimited, some really interesting new models for the presentation of women's sport coming to the light. And the, the gist of that is it's, it, they've actually completely changed how um, the consumer engages in it. And it's more of a fantasy model where you're, you know, each athlete themselves individually has the point system. It's very, very different than, than sport originally was structured on. And, um, so I think we just, we need to keep our ear to the ground for, for how that's shifting and, um, and brands need to see that, um, the data behind the outcome of these really courageous sponsors that are out there and, and going for it. It's pretty. I think I should also shout out the secret, the deodorant, um, company for sponsoring the PWHPA. I've seen, um, Adidas doing some stuff, I think, is it with Sarah Nurse? So I think that, you know, these companies are, are, are trying to, to, I guess, transform a little bit or really respond to to the times and as you mentioned not do it for inspiration but doing it because it's the right thing to do far i want to skip back to you because if there's anybody on the the call who's either a student or thinking of pursuing a career um, as a data scientist working for a sport organization you know can you just briefly i know i know you do a lot of stuff because you we talked earlier what is your day-to-day -day look like and what are some of the projects that you, you work on to help the operations of these leagues and uh, uh, I know the draft, the NBA draft is on tonight, and I know uh, data and analytics is, is helps to fuel that type of process. So can you touch on a little bit about what you do in your role? Yeah, so my day-to-day, -day, um, and I'll make sure I include my team because my team, they do most of the work. Um, I'm just the pretty face behind it. Or no, you're it. not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a pretty face. Right. No, I was gonna say, you do the work as well too. You're not just the face, the brains as <laughs> well. You. Yeah. So, so first of all, um, not by like, you know, intention, my team is 50% male and 50% female and they come from diverse background. And I think, um, one of the way that one of my data scientists had incredible challenge of landing a job as a data scientist. Um, and she has two masters in astrophysics, something that just very wow. simply applies to the world of sports. Right. Um, and I, and I don't necessarily know what her entire experience was, but I remember seeing her resume and just blown away, um, and kind of hearing that she's had a hard time finding a career, um, as a scientist, um, as was interesting. She is except like exceptional, one of the best data scientists I consider, maybe I'm biased in the sports industry. Um, 
However, so just kind of talking a bit about the day to day, um, oftentimes we, we work on long term projects. So things that, uh, you know, the, the team might not use immediately to make a decision about who they're going to draft tonight, but uh, something that could uh, that they see uh, using when they're make, making a decision around, OK, uh, you know, in 2022. We might have different limitations for scouting. We might be resource depleted. We might be, uh, you know, uh, we might not be able to travel. We don't really know where COVID is going to stand. Sorry, 2021. Um, I'm already thinking 2021. <laughs> <laughs> and 2022. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's where my mind is already that, hey, we're in the future. Um, but I think uh, we work on those long-term projects and they're long-term because it just takes a lot of time for us to collect data. So if we think about, you know, scouting projects, we are looking at what type of insights can a scout benefit from, not to replace a scout's eye because that is irreplaceable, but just to kind of uh, allow them to focus on things differently um, so that, you know, maybe they're not attending, uh, you know, every single um, uh, prospects game, um, but they're kind of cherry picking where they, they want to spend their attention and time. So oftentimes that's the type of project that we that we focus on. And my day to day and my team's day to day is is a lot of physics and math primarily, and a lot of coding and reading a lot of research paper, um, and then applying uh, our knowledge to to kind of the the problems that exist in sports. Uh, so it could be something like uh, improving the existing shot prediction or rebound prediction model. Um, or it could be something like, uh, you know, looking at a congested schedule and, you know, uh, what is the risk of players now playing in the bubble um, in a more congested schedule when they're also playing very, like, you know, high minute loads? What does that look like for them long term and short term? So those are those are kind of our day to day tasks. It sounds so cool. <laughs> it is. I am the luckiest person. This is the, I, am, I have the best job. I cannot complain. Uh, surrounded by really amazing people. And I definitely consider myself lucky. Laura, I'll get you to jump in on this tech talk. You know, uh, we talked about the fan engagement digital side. We talked about, you know, those uh, on the on the team like Farah's working on the data behind it to give all of us great experiences to still continue to engage in sport. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you're you're uh, you're you're hearing from your students in the sense of wanting to work in different areas of sport? I know sport media is very popular, but we're hearing from Farah and Tiffany's an entrepreneur and Auburn's and you know. Uh, branded marketing, you know, how are you keeping your students on the cusp of what else is out there for, for working in sport? Well, definitely the technology side. And as I mentioned before, the analytics is becoming more popular in this space. From a fan engagement standpoint, it, we've, we've actually just brought on a new professor um, that is teaching a media audiences course, which is fantastic. And one thing that I have in common with him, and I think with Farah, is the uh, my research tends to be on the quantitative side, so the multivariate and the multi-regression and, and overall statistics side of sport and fan engagement and audiences. And that is definitely, so we can build the, you know, one of the things that the students were teaching them is obviously about content. How do we produce content? As I said, the technology side, the very fact that we have to be more remote um, is a very big part of it, but also how do we know you could create the greatest piece of content in the world, but how do we know the fans are engaging with it? And what is overall the sort of the psychological side of what is motivating a fan to consume the content? And that's looking at the analytics of it. And, you know, I think that it's giving a totally different name now to, to, to plain old marketing that, that has been or used to be and, and looking at it from the perspective of, of data and really understanding where that is and, and, yeah, uh, you know, there's, and there's also a different, multiple different fan types. So, you know, some fans are definitely interested in the quantitative, the numbers, the statistics um, side of things, whereas others are more interested in, you know, who Roger Federer, what watch is Roger Federer wearing? And, and so how do we work with Rolex to, to build some sort of a campaign or a timing shot clock over at Wimbledon? So, you know, those kind of things are the areas that we're really trying to make sure that the students are aware of. Um, obviously, last year with you, Ayanka, and running the women in sports and tech, 
uh, which is phenomenal because that is also becoming the technical side of production, the technical side of broadcast and where streaming is going. Um, and, you know, I, I focus on fans, emerging technology, of course, underlying um, diversity and inclusion and the esports space and the sport video game esports space is of tremendous interest and that is something that you know that has been doing very well i know i know espn has just dropped esports and you know we won't get into that this evening but it, it is very difficult for the big traditional broadcasters to generate revenue in that space and it's not impossible but i think we're we can do a whole show on that <laughs> but but, the, but esports and the way that it, the, the stream cast, uh, the hardware partners and, and the streaming partners and, and the way that you're monetizing it has, has got a really big opportunity, I think, for, for sport video games in particular. Auburn, you know, what advice do you have for uh, anyone that wants to get into brand and marketing in sports? Um, if they don't want to do some of the other, you know, we talked about sport media, data scientists, data analytics, or you know, other, other areas in sport, if they really wanted to get on the marketing side, you know, what advice do you have for them? Well, it's a good question. I mean, dad is part of it. <laughs> you can't avoid that side of things for sure. Um, I mean, ultimately it's just all about um, being creative, being curious and being ready to disrupt, right? And, um, and, you know, putting yourself out there and putting yourself in the shoes of the consumer and, and thinking about the empathy side, but also the data side and, and understanding all that. So, you know, getting into the business, start low and work your tail off. You know, it's all about grit and, and showing what you've got. And that's one thing, I mean, having been an athlete that I learned and like again and again and again, especially in the sport that I was in is you've got to be ready to be resilient and bounce back from just about anything. And that comes down to grit. So, um, and Tiffany, on the entrepreneurial side of things, we're seeing a lot of startups, um, you know, just kind of entering and growing and entering in the, the whole sports landscape. Uh, for anyone on the call, whether they're a student or they're just tuning in, um, you took the jump. So do you have any advice on how to take the jump, <laughs> take the leap? Oh, man. Um, I, yeah, I'm kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> it's so funny because I, I like just was super comfortable at ESPN and I was like itching like I have to do something next um I think so if anyone's on the call is interested in entrepreneurship I would say definitely check out Y Combinator startup school um there's about like 10 sessions that I did like extremely helpful I would also read Peter Thiel's zero to one um I read that in the summer of last year and that was right before I started kind of thinking about Kira Story's business model. Um, and what was your why? Like why I built it or what, like why yeah. I took the leap? Both. Um, both. <laughs> so why I built it, I just started to see media just changing rapidly and um it really pissed me off how that's one thing like only build something if something pisses you off like if, if, uh, if that should uh, be on a t-shirt somewhere I don't know <laughs> yeah. you know but it's actually it's kind of true because imagine you being on the verge of burnout every day and just working hours on end like you are creating a solution for a problem that pisses you off right so um it was interesting how I noticed like YouTube is very predatory and I don't think people realize how predatory it is. Um, a, you don't control any of your videos. Um, they just decide to throw an ad whenever they want to. They put the skip ad feature up there on purpose so they don't have to pay everyone because if it's not up there, then they have to pay you for people watching your ads. Um, and it's just, it's just weird how you don't control your video content. With podcasting, it's completely different. You control your podcast. You get to create your own ads. Like there's so many things that you fully control, which is why podcasting has had this huge boom. But video has still kind of been in the dark ages. Um, I've also was super pissed off that like student athletes and athletes get taken advantage of a lot by the media, um, especially women. And I think that 
honestly, women are the best content creators ever. So, um, yeah. yeah. So that was, <laughs> that was my, that was my why. What made me take the You got leap? pissed off and then you got passionate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what made me take the leap was, I was thinking about entrepreneurship at ESPN. Like that's just, it's just how I am. Um, and I had a meeting with the director of, of data at Instagram. And it was interesting because he was just like, hey, like I, am, I know you're curious in startup world, like definitely do your thing. If it fails, we would hire you in a second. So hearing that from like the VP of data at Instagram was pretty nice too. I was like, oh, okay. Like I'm not getting any younger. And <laughs> I mean, I have a safety net if I need it. So um, ironically, he's not there anymore and no one is there at Instagram <laughs> because um, I would also recommend the book, No Filter, which is the relationship between Facebook and Instagram. It's very interesting. Um, but that conversation, I think I quit a couple months after at ESPN. Um, so yeah, I think just having people believe in you and knowing that, I mean, I don't know. If there's legs to what you're building and you're super passionate about it, then why not try? Cause you're always gonna be thinking about it a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I would say. I like, I like oh, that. I, I, and also be obsessed with KPIs because like that is the only way that you're going to get money. Like you have to be able to show <laughs> exponential growth in your KPIs. I love all those tips and I feel like I could talk to you guys for the rest of the night, but we want to bring in um, our attendees to see if they have any questions. Um, I'm not sure in the back end, uh, Isabel, does it, is there anyone that has a question? I don't think um, the questions have started to roll in yet, but I did actually have a question for Tiffany. You mentioned how uh, yes. um, with athletes, sometimes they take advantage of them due to um, like not paying them. How do you feel that the NCAA has kind of lifted that a bit? I believe like they're allowing them to get some sort of money from advertising. Name or them or yeah. So it's really funny actually what happened. Um, legislation was coming down. So this like the states were purposely starting to like have their own legislation so florida california they were coming out and saying like screw you ncaa like we're gonna let our athletes in the state make money from their name image and likeness and name image and likeness just means like social media you can run camps and get paid um like tech like literally anything that you can make money just off of who you are without the school's name and logo being affiliated that's what this NCAA is um, allowing now starting in 2021. But it was honestly because states were threatening to have their own legislation, which would have completely screwed the governing body. Um, so they're like, okay, we kind of have to do something about this. But also just imagine like you're a student athlete, you make billions of dollars for the school and you have like YouTubers walking on campus that make thousands of, you know what I mean? So it was, I think the NCAA was also just like, okay, we kind of have to have to figure this out. Um, so that's that's what what happened with that. Yeah. There's a question. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. There's a question um in the chat as well. Yes. Um, from Wendy Porter. How receptive have male athletes been to help in the initiatives to monetize women's sports? Does anyone want? So what? To so Wendy touched on um the orange hoodies that the NBA male players were wearing. Um, and then the Swedish Swedish men's national soccer team for going their pay to allow negotiations for equal pay with the women's national team. But she's saying that these examples are kind of few and far in between. Um, are there ways to build better partnerships with male athletes to use their platforms to raise more awareness of women's sport? What's interesting, I, what's interesting oh, is I actually okay. don't think the male, I don't think the male athletes is the problem. Like male, like they love watching women's sports. Like majority of them will tell you, like I watch the WNBA like all the time. I just, I try to learn from them, right? Like, so it's, it's, it's not athletes. Like I, and cause even they're, obviously the men make way more money and they don't have the issues that the women are having, but they still have it where they aren't allowed to kind of kind of put their own media and stories out too so that I feel like they're so marginalized in that way or like shut up and dribble right so like 
they are not the ones that I think are the the ones that are not championing championing women, women's sports. It's it's the directors, it's the executives, it's the VPs, it's the people that hold the purse strings. So I feel like the work needs to be done there. And how do we get the work to be done there? I will let other people jump in. Auburn, did you um, want to touch on that? Because there's a partnership. I just wanted to make. Oh, Farah, uh, sorry. Pay- Yeah, sorry, just to kind of piggyback on Tiffany's point, though, and I think like this has been in my head, so I really need to get this out. Yes, get it Um, out. (laughs) (laughs) Like this whole like excuse that corporation broadcast, whoever has that like, you know, female sports, not like as engaging as fans, like it's not fast paced, whatever, right? Excuses. That's literally, that's all it is. Um, And I think it is a lot to say like, hey, athletes are responsible for it. Like male athletes need to do more. Female athletes need to do more. Like Candace Candace friggin' Parker. Candace Parker, she's a mom. She's a WNBA athlete, okay? Like just legit, like skilled player. Um, And she has like three other jobs. She's on a podcast. (laughs) She has her own podcast. Like that oh, sounds like the host. typical she's the typical answer. woman, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a typical that's a that's typical the woman size. <laughs> So it's basically like even even how she like articulates her points with like when she's having conversations with Shaq. Um I mean she's just a superstar. And you know, but it's interesting to see someone like her who has about like six hundred thousand Instagram followers. But then you look at certain like individual sports like CrossFit. Um, where, you know, the, the, the last time a Canadian athlete from CrossFit was, um, uh, like, you know, won the CrossFit, CrossFit games, um, she has, she to this day has over 1 million followers. Um, so to me, that is very interesting. And I feel like this whole excuse that woman sports is not marketable. It's not fast paced. I feel it's stuff like that that just kind of falters. And then the other thing too is like, I mean, if you look at the Toronto market, it, like sports is huge. There were 3 million people that showed up for the Raptors parade. 3 million. That is so many people. That and like <laughs> that, like, and the parade, you, it's not like, you know, it was like a two hour, you know, just, you know, you, you were like, you had to rough it. Like it was a six to 12 hours event for some of us. So to me, it, again, like, like there's a huge demand of sports uh, from fans. It's just, I feel like people kind of create this narrative that women's sports is not as engaging because it's, uh, especially team sports is not as engaging because it's not fast paced or because it's not as explosive as male sports. And to me, it's just like, it's excuses. a, it's it's a lot of excuses big, and yeah. And, and Laurel knows this, I'll say it too. Uh, you know, people. I, you know, people might be upset by this, but I think the sport industry right now is in a very. Some of it is in a very stale place, um, and there are some people who are doing great work, but there are some people who are lazy, and we cannot rest on uh, old narratives, um, old stereotypes that women's sport isn't going to sell. Look at the WNBA. Um, we know uh, the broadcasters have given them more uh, programming hours. Uh, fans, I think it was a. Uh, uh, Ionescu, her jersey sold out in like minutes. Um, we do know there's data that women probably spend way more money on sport um, paraphernalia than men do. We know there's data that says over 60% of people, so that's men and whoever, everybody under the sun, um, watch at least one women's sport. And those stats are going and, and growing and growing and growing. The data is there. I, it's just this industry is very slow to, a, to a, a adopt itself or adapt, I should say. And, um, you know, consumers want, con- women consumers want, diverse consumers want, LGBTQ plus uh, consumers of sport want to see, um, you know, sports. It doesn't matter who's on the field. They want to see this. They want to um, purchase sports items. So, you know, market to everybody. <laughs> That's what it is. But there, there's there's yeah. a lot of excuses, as you said. There's a lot of laziness. Um, and we, but we can't stay stuck here. And, you know, that's what I said earlier. It's it just, we just can't. Auburn, it's it's sorry. going to happen. It's going yes. to happen in like five years, man. I'm telling you now, it's going to change and broadcast and all these big companies it's this is their opportunity to jump on it like oh yeah because they don't they're not in the driver's seat anymore to be honest like yeah like media conglomerates still have um sports rights and broadcasting rights but like money talks at the end of the day so if you're noticing 
women athletes with all of these large followers, they're going to be like, oh crap, we should probably like put them on the air, right? Because that's money comes with that so but we yeah. don't want to be an afterthought you know and we, we mentioned that we don't want to be an afterthought or let's just add one woman in there we want to be at the table we we see women yeah. investing in sports so the nwsl uh with you know a, a, a huge team of female investors we did see danny garcia um invest in um i think it's the xfl um you know women are there we've got the money <laughs> We're just going to come together and we're going to be at the, the seat of the table. You know, I think what the beauty of what I'm seeing now, and I even look at She's for Sports is I'm not waiting for anybody to say, put diverse women, you know, on a, on a, on a, an interview or do a, a film feature or a digital series. I think we're, there's some of us in this generation where we're just doing it, you know, and I think that's what's going to happen with the sports industry. There's going to be different drivers and different people just saying enough is enough. You got to do it. And hopefully that, you know, we can kind of change something and move that needle. Auburn, I've, I've been trying to get to you because I know you want to, you want to add to this because that question talked about, you know, partnerships and, and, you know, not just the men wearing these, uh, you know, wearing the different women's sporting gear but just you know how do how do brands fit into all of this well, i wanted to comment uh like back to the original question too and, and far you're right i think we're at the precipice of a, a movement like things are shifting in a big way but um wendy's question was really interesting to me we're seeing a bit of that with the nba and wnba because they're it they aren't being treated as a silo they're operated in a similar corporate structure whereas other sports, the male and female factions of the sport are completely siloed. And so it's a cultural issue in the sense that there isn't the cross pollination. There isn't a culture of um, support and camaraderie between the, I mean, even men's and women's soccer in this nation, men's and women's rugby, whatever it is, they're not being, um, um, they're not being put into a culture of collaboration. And so Sweden, I'd actually like to look into that and see, understand what's the, the impetus and the motivation that it came from the men. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, that the way that what's happening with the NBA is actually a big piece of the puzzle in terms of the, tip, the tipping point, because these huge people of influence, I mean, Tiffany, you mentioned these women with huge followings, but men with huge followings are saying, you have to pay attention to this. This is something that's worth watching. It's cool. It's fun. It's excellent sport. And, you know, the men are giving kudos on social media to feats that are happening on the court on the women's side of the game. That is monumental in terms of momentum shift. So that's, I, it's really exciting to see. And I, I think we need to see more of it, but it, it comes down to the way the sports are structured and the way people are um, creating culture within sport, whether it's device divisive or collaborative between men and women. Yeah, if I could comment as well, I think um, I, Tiffany, I, 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 I like your sentiment in terms of the players. However, I'm of a different mindset because I agree then, and also with Auburn that the NBA is leading this and they are the, they are the sport, they're the organization that is, that is changing and they are leading this change. And, um, but I also, when I take a look at Sue Bird and Candace Parker and how much they're making compared to the men and having to have multiple jobs, you know, in hockey, men are making $10 million a year and women are making a stipend. We're making a stipend of a thousand or $3,000 um, stipend, which then the Canadian government thought, oh, well, they're getting paid. So you're, you know, they don't even see the organization as a charity, which we obviously don't want anyone to see. And I happen to agree with Auburn when you made that comment earlier, but corporations are not to be left off the hook on this because, you know, I'm really pleased. And I love the fact that things are advancing um, by seeing secret as an example, or someone said Adidas as an example, but I would argue, tell me how much you're spending and how much people are actually getting paid for that. Because, you know, when, when Adidas sponsored the Canadian Women's Hockey League, if I'm not mistaken, they gave them equipment and they gave them uniforms to wear on All-Star Day. That Well, uniforms and equipment is a start, but that's not gonna drive anybody's mortgage. So how do you, <laughs> let's take it to another level. And, and, and I really do think that some more transparency needs to be seen as opposed to, we're doing this and that's a start. So even performative measures on things, I still think is a good thing, but let's be realistic and real in terms of what you actually are investing in female sport and females in general. Um, 
with Kia Nurse, are, is it a multi-million dollar partnership? Because it should be, but if it's a 50, 60, 70,000, $100,000 deal, I'm, I'm happy for her and I'm so excited for her, but I got to tell you that it is not enough and it's, it's, it, it, it needs to be grown. And finally, just in terms of where the decisions are making, and this is why I keep talking about dismantling this, because the research also shows, uh, um, I can't think of the person right now, I'll have to come back to you, Ianka, on this, but the, at the board level, the governance level at all, so whether it's a professional sport or amateur, high performance, recreational sport, it is predominantly controlled and powered by white, older, 50 plus males. And so the decisions that they're even making on, oh, let's pay women is, oh, let's pay women $1,000. That's a really good thing. I think they'll like that as opposed to being like, hold on a second, let's take a look at this a little bit differently. So this whole the hegemonic masculinity of the decisions that are being made is what needs to change the system. And, um, and if they're not going to change the system, then we need to be more like Serena Williams, who said, I'm not going to play then, unless you're going to mm -hmm. pay the amount of money, I'm not going to play. And that's where I was chatting earlier about the sacrifices. She was able to, she was in a position, fortunately, that she was able to say, I'm not going to play. Uh, that's not necessarily the same. Yeah. Some people can't. <laughs> they got to pay their bills, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. you know, and, and, and so that's that's one thing. And just just finally, if you take a look at even with Serena Williams, if you take a look at the Forbes top 100 endorsement list, there's usually one female, Serena Williams, maybe two, yeah. like Danica Patrick, Ronda Rousey happened to be on that. Um, Sharapova happened to be on that but year over year over year. So that's where I'm like, is there, you know, do we need to make $34 million a year? Could you make 33 and let the women make one? It's just a thought. Yeah, it's interesting because we also have seen the conversation where certain sports like golf and I believe tennis, uh, the purse, they're trying to make it equitable where, you know, the men are getting paid a certain purse when they win a tennis match and women are. Um, but again, we talked about far and few between. I mean, we're still seeing a lot of challenges with pay equity across the sport landscape. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a very interesting conversation. I think we probably need another event for that, right? <laughs> Is there another question from uh, one of the attendees? Yes, we actually have two more. Um, one's from an anonymous attendee, and it is, what is one piece of advice you can give to college students looking to work in sports one day after college? And so like on day one when they get into college or after they leave? I think they when they're graduating? After. Oh, when they're graduating. Who wants to take that? I can try. I can give it a shot. Uh, Tiffany, you can take you know, I feel like I'm the that. youngest <laughs> low key, but it's totally fine. Go ahead. Um, I would suggest like, so to get within sports industry, I think, again, be intentional. What exactly interests you? Where, which area do you want to go into? But then you don't, don't limit yourself just to work for sports teams. I think a lot of people oftentimes think that they need to work for a sports team. You could look at uh, vendors. So I know like uh, Second Spectrum is currently hiring a computer vision intern. Um, so there's there's a whole bunch of, uh, there's a massive landscape that is in, that kind of sits, uh, you know, next to the sports and uh, the teams itself. And oftentimes the teams really look at these vendors to pull uh, pull from. So it's a great way to kind of get into the industry. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is always work on a portfolio, whether you're marketing, mm -hmm. whether you're uh, a data scientist, for a data scientist or data engineer, it's typically creating like a GitHub repo. If you have you know re written any research paper, making sure that's uh, that's linked in your resume or it's on LinkedIn. Um, and you know, on the marketing side, just, you know, have a website that kind of curates all your everything you've created and you've published, even if it's part of your school curriculum. I like that. The portfolio thing yeah. is huge. I would actually echo all of that. Um, I would just add like networking is obviously extremely important. So with um, what Farah was mentioning about portfolio, I got hired at ESPN because I did their hackathon and I built a metric and presented it at MIT and they hired me within a month, but I wouldn't have gotten that job or had gotten an, an interview right on site unless the hiring manager knew who I was because I had taken this other like 
class webinar thing for um, for a couple weeks, and it was with a former employee that was also on that team. So yeah, I would say just networking your butt off is extremely important. Just um, getting out there and meeting people and just letting personality shine through and people will remember you most likely than not. Yes, and um, we have another question from Grace Esford. If you any of you have questions, please put in the Q&A uh, chat section. And she asked, who have your mentors been? What's one piece of advice your mentor has given you that resonated the most? I know it's a very big one. Uh, I would say Billy Bean because I watched Moneyball. <laughs> <laughs> but he also was one of the very few people I met him at a conference and I asked if he would chat with me just for a couple of minutes and he gave me 10 minutes of his time and just some of the way he talked about the type of risks you should take um, was life-changing one thing he did say that hey you I could take those risks because you know I I had a lot of job security and I had money and whatever so don't take my risks, haha, if you're not completely secure. Um, so, so I would say definitely, you know, in that area, Billy Bean. And uh, as a new mom in the industry, I would say Candace Parker. Uh, just, just a hustler, just incredible role model. Um, and yeah, just amazing. Not a mentor. None of them really mentored me, but I, I just like imagine. <laughs> From afar. <everywhere>. Yeah. <laughs> Is there another question? I did see. Or did, uh, did anybody want to answer the last question? I've had, I've had many mentors uh, and I think mentors come in and out of your life for reasons at certain times within your career. I do wish that I had a mentor um, throughout my career when I was at, um, at the NHL as an example, and not only a mentor, but a champion internally in the organization. Um, you know, there was a, 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 a CMO at one of the major organizations here, or global organization, insurance organization that took me under her wing and really believed in me and gave me the confidence. And it was wonderful to, to have conversations with her about certain things, which is actually I had the conversation about when I was doing, going to do my executive MBA. Um, and then I also had a male mentor and he's still a very good mentor to me to this day. And it was great to hear, to see both sides especially in the sport industry, because, um, you know, and I, I feel sometimes like I was before my time because I was advocating for gender equity in sport uh, 20 years ago. And uh, that was new. <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, I, I, it wasn't necessarily well received a lot of the organizations that I was at. So it was great to also have a male perspective to help me guide through those days um, but I also think the key word here is champion, that someone is going to look out for you. So you may not be someone in your organization, but if you are able to have someone that says, you know, this job is opening or make sure so-and-so is at the table, because sometimes we don't get invited to the table, we're forgotten. And it's great to be able to say, hey, why is, why is Isabel not here? Why is Wendy not here? Make sure that that person is here or a job opens and they automatically think of you for that position and advocate for you. So I think that's key. I think we have to sneak in one more question. Okay, yeah, um, we have a question from Philip. So NBA uh, 2K20 finally included all 12 WNBA teams in game in the game last year. Do you think esports can push for equality in this game? Uh, could that help drive revenue? It's actually crazy. I didn't know they just added the WNBA, like 2020. <laughs> Did you guys know that? I didn't know that. I saw something on Twitter about that, but I also remember seeing a lot more chatter around um, Chiquita Evans, the first woman that was in uh, NBA 2K20. So I heard a little bit more about her, but I didn't hear that much about uh, the WNBA stuff, but I think I saw something on Twitter about it, but that's amazing. Who wants to take that one on? Uh, happy and just well I'll just say week one comment sorry I don't want to mean, mean to monopolize it just happens to be what I teach on the esports side next semester and you know well Ianka you're you're ahead of your time too you had Dr. Jen Welter who was the first female NFL coach in Madden 20 in, in Madden 19 and is now again in Madden 20 and she does talk about how 
that actually grows the sport of football and the participation and, and young women seeing that they can have a space in football, whether that is in the, the online space or the actual space. And we're seeing that more and more today. So yes, 100% to be able to drive revenue. And, and, and uh, so to see how they're gonna monetize this and, and give opportunities, I just hope that the women get a piece of it. But yes. And I should say, sorry, Chiquita Evans was, uh, I got into NBA at 2K, it was, 20, it was 2019. But I remember hearing a lot about her being the first woman. Does anyone else want to add to that question? Or did Laura, Laurel, you ended it well. <laughs> well, we want to thank everybody. We want to thank our panelists, obviously. And I personally want to thank uh, Laurel and her GX, X, GXS lab team. They were phenomenal to work with. And, um, you know, this was a great ending to our Be Bold series. We, somebody I think saw in the chat that they were wondering if there was going to be a recording of this, this awesome panel. Yes, we will have a recording app so that uh, you can go back and, and, and reference it or share it with your colleagues. So uh, thanks to our panelists. Thanks to everyone who asked phenomenal questions. Uh, that was great. It was a great Q&A. And, um, you know, look out on our, both of our social sites, GXS Labs, uh, website and social sites and she's for sports's social media sites to find out what we're going to be doing next because uh, as we said in this panel 2021 um, is going to be great and we're going to continue uh, you know to to move that needle for inclusion in sport for women and all people who want to be a part of it so thank you so much for everyone who uh, tuned in and our, our wonderful panel today and the GXS lab team I hope you guys uh, have a great night and happy holidays bye thank you Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.